Eats, Shoots and Leaves, written and read by Lynn Truss. Either this will ring bells for you, or it won't. A printed banner has appeared on the concourse of a petrol station near to where I live. Come inside, it says, for CDs, videos, DVDs and books, and every one of those plurals has an apostrophe before the S. If this satanic sprinkling of redundant apostrophes causes no gasp of horror, you should probably stop listening at once. By all means, congratulate yourself that you're not a pedant, that you're happily equipped to live in a world of plummeting punctuation standards, but just don't bother to go any further. For any true stickler, you see, the sight of the plural word books with an apostrophe in it will trigger an emotional process similar to the stages of bereavement, though greatly accelerated. First, there's shock. Within seconds, shock gives way to disbelief, disbelief to pain, and pain to anger. Finally, and this is where the analogy breaks down, anger gives way to a righteous urge to perpetrate an act of criminal damage with the aid of a permanent marker. It's tough being a stickler for punctuation these days. True, one occasionally hears a marvellous punctuation joke about a panda who eats, shoots and leaves, but in general the stickler's exquisite sensibilities are assaulted from all sides. Everywhere one looks, there are signs of ignorance and indifference. What about that film Two Weeks Notice, its posters slung along the sides of buses in letters four feet tall, with no apostrophe in sight? I remember at the start of the Two Weeks Notice publicity campaign, in the spring of 2003, emerging cheerfully from Victoria Station and stopping dead in my tracks. Where was the apostrophe? If it were one month's notice, I reasoned, there'd be an apostrophe S. Therefore, two weeks' notice requires an S apostrophe. Buses that I should have caught sailed off up Buckingham Palace Road while I communed thus with my inner stickler. Part of one's despair, of course, is that the world cares nothing for the little shocks endured by the sensitive stickler. While we look in horror at a badly punctuated sign, the world carries on around us blind to our plight. We're like the little boy in the sixth sense who can see dead people, except that we can see dead punctuation. Whisper it in petrified little boy tones, dead punctuation is invisible to everyone else, yet we see it all the time. No one understands us seventh sense people, they regard us as freaks. When we point out illiterate mistakes, we're often aggressively instructed to get a life by people who, interestingly, display no evidence of having lives themselves. Naturally, we become timid about making our insights known in such inhospitable conditions. Being burned as a witch is not safely enough off the agenda. A sign has gone up in a local charity shop window which says, boldly, Can you spare any old records? No question mark. And I dither daily outside on the pavement. Should I go in and mention it? It does matter that there's no question mark on a direct question. It's appalling ignorance. But what will I do if the elderly charity shop lady gives me the usual disbelieving stare and then tells me to bugger off, get a life and mind my own business? I'm well aware there's little profit in asking for sympathy for sticklers. We aren't the easiest people to feel sorry for. We refuse to patronise any shop with checkouts for eight items or less because it should be fewer. And when words such as phenomena, media or cherubim are treated as singular... The media says it was quite a phenomena looking at those cherubims. Some of us can't suppress actual screams. In short, we sticklers are unattractive, know-all obsessives who get things out of proportion and are in continual peril of being disowned by our exasperated families. I know precisely when my own damned stickler personality started to get the better of me. In the autumn of 2002, I was making a series of radio programmes about punctuation called Cutting a Dash. My producer invited John Richards of the Apostrophe Protection Society to come and talk to us. At that time, I was quite tickled by the idea of an Apostrophe Protection Society. We took Mr Richards on a trip down Berwick Street Market to record his reaction to some greengrocer's punctuation and then sat down for a chat about how exactly one goes about protecting a printer's mark that, through no fault of its own, seems to be flailing in a welter of confusion. What the society does, he said, is to write courteous letters explaining the correct use of the apostrophe. It was at this point that I felt the awakening of my inner stickler. But that's not enough, I said. Suddenly I was abuzz with ideas. What about issuing stickers printed with the words, this apostrophe is not necessary? What about telling people to shin up ladders at dead of night with an apostrophe-shaped stencil and a tin of paint? 
Why did the Apostrophe Protection Society not have a militant wing? Could I start one? Where do you get balaclavas? Punctuation has been defined many ways. Some use the analogy of stitching. Punctuation is the basting that holds the fabric of language in shape. Another tells us that punctuation marks are the traffic signals of language. They tell us to slow down, notice this, take a detour and stop. Best of all, I think, is the simple advice given by the style book of a national newspaper that punctuation is a courtesy designed to help readers to understand a story without stumbling. Isn't the analogy with good manners perfect? Truly good manners are invisible. They ease the way for others without drawing attention to themselves. The practice of pointing our writing has always been offered in a spirit of helpfulness to underline meaning and prevent awkward misunderstandings. Remember Ronnie Barker in Porridge, reading the sign-off from a fellow lag's letter from home, Now I must go and get on my lover, and then pretending to notice a comma, so hastily changing it to, Now I must go and get on my lover. To be fair, many people who couldn't punctuate their way out of a paper bag are still interested in the way punctuation can alter the sense of a string of words. It's the basis of all I'm sorry I'll read that again jokes. A woman without her man is nothing can very easily become a woman without her man is nothing. But just to show there's nothing very original about all this, 500 years ago a rather tiresome puzzle was going round. Every lady in this land hath twenty nails on each hand, five and twenty on hands and feet, and this is true without deceit. In other words, and correctly punctuated, every lady in this land has twenty nails, on each hand five, and twenty on hands and feet. All of which substantiates Eric Partridge's metaphor for punctuation in his usage and abusage, which is that it's the line along which the train must travel if it isn't to run away with its driver. In other words, punctuation keeps sense on the rails. What happened to punctuation? Why is it so disregarded when it's self-evidently so useful in preventing enormous mix-ups? A headline in today's paper says, Dead Son's Photos May Be Released. The story relates to dead sons in the plural, but you'd never know, for there's not an apostrophe in sight. The obvious culprit is the recent history of education practice. We can blame the pedagogues. Until 1960, punctuation was routinely taught in British schools. A child sitting a county school's exam in 1937 would be asked to punctuate the following puzzler. Charles I walked and talked half an hour after his head was cut off. Answer. Charles I walked and talked. Full stop. Half an hour after, comma, his head was cut off. Today, thank goodness, the national curriculum ensures that when children are eight, they're drilled in the use of the comma. But if things are now looking faintly more optimistic, there remains the awful truth that for over a quarter of a century, punctuation and English grammar were simply not taught in the majority of schools. The result was that A-level candidates couldn't even spell the words grammar and sentence, let alone use them in any well-informed way. In those dark side of the moon years in British education, teachers upheld the view that grammar and spelling got in the way of self-expression. It's arguable that the timing of their grammatical apathy couldn't have been worse. In the 1970s, no educationist would have predicted the explosion in universal written communication caused by the personal computer, the internet and the keypad of the mobile phone. But now look what's happened. Everyone's a writer, and people who've been taught nothing about their own language are, contrary to educational expectations, spending all their leisure hours attempting to string sentences together for the edification of others. What happens when punctuation isn't used? Well, if punctuation is the stitching of language, language comes apart, obviously, and all the buttons fall off. If punctuation provides the traffic signals, words bang into each other, and everyone ends up in minehead. It's worth standing up for punctuation because, without it, there's no reliable way of communicating meaning. Punctuation herds words together, keeps others apart. Punctuation directs you how to read in the way musical notation directs a musician how to play. In short, a cat has claws at the ends of its paws, a comma's a pause at the end of a clause. Every language expert from Dr Johnson onwards has accepted that it's a mistake to attempt to embalm the language. Of course it must change and adapt. As we struggle to preserve a system under attack, it's useful to remember that a reader from a couple of hundred years ago will be shocked by present-day punctuation. 
Why don't we use capital letters for all nouns anymore? Why don't we use full stops after everyday abbreviations? Why not combine colons with dashes sometimes? Where did all the commas go? Why isn't there a hyphen in the word today? Looks are mussy. What sort of punctuation chickens are we at the beginning of the 21st century? Well, taking just the initial capital letters and the terminating full stop, these are conventions that haven't always been there. The initial letter of a sentence was first capitalised in the 13th century, but the rule was not consistently applied until the 16th. Nowadays, the convention for starting a new sentence with a capital letter is so ingrained that word processing software won't allow you to type a full stop and then a lowercase letter. It will capitalise automatically. This is good news for those who've spotted the inexorable advance of lowercase into book titles, television captions, company names, and, of course, everything on the non-case-sensitive internet, and lie awake at night worrying about the confusion this is spreading in young minds. Meanwhile, the full stop is surely the simplest mark to understand, so long as everyone continues to have some idea what a sentence is, which is a condition that can't be guaranteed. Every time the sentence ends, there's a full stop or a full stop substitute, such as the exclamation mark or the question mark. As easy as that. Incidentally, the American name for it, period, was one of its original English names too. Shakespeare called the full stop a period in A Midsummer Night's Dream when he described nervous players making periods in the midst of sentences. Meanwhile, nowadays the illiterate default punctuation mark is the comma, and this gives even more calls for alarm. The tap water is safe to drink in tea and coffee, however, we recommend using bottled water for drinking, it can be purchased very cheaply in the nearby shops. Not a full stop in view. In Mind the Stop, written 60 years ago, G. V. Carey defines punctuation as being governed two-thirds by rule and one-third by personal taste. My own position is similar. In some matters of punctuation there are simple rights and wrongs. In others, one must apply a good ear to good sense. I want the greatest clarity from punctuation, which means, supremely, that I want apostrophes where they should be, and I will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand until everyone knows the difference between its, no apostrophe, and its, apostrophe s, and bloody well nobody writes about dead son's photos without indicating whether the photos in question show one son or several. So what I propose is action. Sticklers unite! You have nothing to lose but your sense of proportion, and arguably, you didn't have a lot of that to begin with. Maybe we won't change the world, but at least we'll feel better. Be a nuisance. Do something. And if possible, use a bright red pen. The English language first picked up the apostrophe in the 16th century. In classical texts, it was used to mark dropped letters. And when English printers adopted it, this was still its only function. So in Shakespeare's time, Hamlet could say, Fiont, spelt O-N apostrophe T, or Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, Tis, spelt apostrophe T-I-S, while Shakespeare's printers substituted an apostrophe for the E of wished. If only the apostrophe's life had stayed that simple. At some point in the 17th century, however, printers started to intrude an apostrophe before the S in singular possessive cases, the girl's apostrophe S dress. And from then on, quite frankly, the whole thing has spiralled into madness. In the 18th century, printers started to put it after plural possessives as well, the girl's S apostrophe dresses, and currently the apostrophe has a whole range of jobs on its CV. Before we start tearing out our hair at sloppy, ignorant current usage, first let's acknowledge the sobering wisdom of the Oxford Companion to English Literature, which says... There never was a golden age in which the rules for the possessive apostrophe were clear-cut and known, understood and followed by most educated people. And then let's check that we know the rules about possessive pronouns, none of which, let me emphasise, requires an apostrophe. It's, for example, hers, ours, yours and theirs. No apostrophes. And now, some of the important tasks the apostrophe is obliged to execute every day. First, a possessive in a singular noun, the boy's hat, apostrophe S. This seems simple, but not so fast, Batman. Even when the possessor is plural, but it doesn't happen to end in an S, the apostrophe precedes the S, the children's playground, apostrophe S. When the possessor is a regular plural, that is, it does end with an S, the apostrophe follows the S, the boy's hats, more than one boy, S apostrophe. 
I apologise if you know all this, but the point is, many, many people don't. Why else would they open a large play area for children, hang up a sign saying, Giant Kids Playground, apostrophe S, and then wonder why everyone stays away? Answer, everyone's scared of the giant kid. A second job for the apostrophe, to indicate time or quantity. In one week's time, apostrophe S. Two weeks notice, S apostrophe. Warner Brothers, take note. Then it indicates the omission of figures in dates the summer of, apostrophe, 68. It indicates the omission of letters. We can't, apostrophe T, go to Joburg, apostrophe before Berg. All the same, it's generally accepted that familiar contractions such as bus for omnibus, flu for influenza, phone for telephone or photo for photograph no longer require apologetic apostrophes. Most famous of all, the apostrophe of omission creates the word it's. I-T apostrophe S, for example, it's your turn, for it is your turn. The confusion of the possessive it's, no apostrophe, with the contractive it's, with apostrophe, is an unequivocal sign of illiteracy and sets off a simple Pavlovian kill response in the average stickler. The rule is, the word it's, with apostrophe, stands for it is or it has. If the word does not stand for it is or it has, then what you require is it's no apostrophe. Getting your it's mixed up is the greatest solecism in the world of punctuation. No matter that you have a PhD and have read all of Henry James twice, if you still persist in writing good food at its best, apostrophe S, you deserve to be struck by lightning, hacked up on the spot and buried in an unmarked grave. Let's move on. The apostrophe appears as of right in Irish names such as O'Neill and O'Casey. The theory that this is a simple contraction of of, as in John O'Gaunt, is a misconception. The O in Irish names is an anglicisation of ua, meaning grandson. I hope that by now you're feeling sorry for the apostrophe, such a list of legitimate jobs. Only one significant task has been lifted from the apostrophe's workload in recent years. It no longer has to appear in the plurals of abbreviations, MPs, or plural dates, 1980s. Except, that is, in America. British readers of the New York Times who assume that this august publication is in constant ignorant error when it allows 1980s apostrophe S evidently have no experience of how that famously punctilious newspaper operates editorially. But it's in the nature of punctuation lovers to care about such things. I once wrote an article for the Daily Telegraph hoping to elicit a few punctuation horror stories and it was like detonating a dam... Hundreds of emails and letters arrived, all of them testifying to the astonishing power of recall we sticklers have when things have annoyed us. It was in 1987, wrote one, I'll never forget, and it said cream teas with an apostrophe S. Reading the letters, I was alternately thrilled that so many people had bothered to write and sunk low by such overwhelming evidence of Britain's stupidity and indifference. The vast majority of letters concern misplaced apostrophes, of course, in simple plurals such as potatoes and lemons. But the greengrocer's apostrophe formed just one depressing category of the overall mind-bogglingly depressing misuse of the apostrophe. Virtually every proper application of this humble mark utterly stumps the people who write to us officially, who paint signs or who sell us fruit and veg. Though there was one letter from a Somerset man who'd cringed regularly at a sign on a market garden until he discovered that its proprietor's name was, and you couldn't make it up, R. Carrot. This explained why the sign said carrots, apostrophe S, at the top, you see, but then listed other vegetables and fruits spelled and punctuated perfectly correctly. Up to now, we've looked at the right and wrong uses of the apostrophe, and I've felt on pretty safe ground. But there are areas of apostrophe use that are not so simple. Take the possessive of proper names ending in S, such as my own. Is this properly Lynn Truss book, spelt with an apostrophe after the S of Truss, or Lynn Truss's book, apostrophe S? Current guides to punctuation, including that ultimate authority, Fowler's Modern English Usage, state that with modern names ending in S, an apostrophe S is required. Thus, it's Keats's poems and St James's Square. With names from the ancient world, it's not required, so it's Archimedes' screw and Achilles' heel, 
an apostrophe after the S in each case. If the name ends in an is sound, an exception is made. It's Moses, tablets, an apostrophe after the S. And an exception is always made for Jesus. Jesus, disciples, an apostrophe after the S. I should add that recently published punctuation guides contain minor disagreements on virtually all aspects of what I've just said. Their only genuine consistency is in using Keats's poems as the prime example. They just can't leave Keats alone. No wonder he developed that cough. I said that there were no absolute rights and wrongs in this matter. However, when many people wrote to ask why St Thomas Hospital in London has no S after the apostrophe, I did feel like echoing Dr Johnson when asked to explain an erroneous definition of his. Ignorance, madam, pure ignorance. Of course it should be St Thomas's Hospital apostrophe S. The trouble is that institutions, towns, colleges, families, companies and brands have authority over their own spelling and punctuation, which is often historic, and there's absolutely nothing we can do except raise an eyebrow. Virtually the first things a British newspaper sub-editor learns are that Lloyd's TSB, the bank, has no apostrophe, unlike Lloyd's of London Insurance. Earl's Court, Gerard's Cross and St Andrew's have no apostrophe, although Earl's Court tube station seems to have acquired one, and you have to give initial capitals to the words Biro and Hoover, otherwise you automatically get tedious letters from solicitors reminding you that these are brand names. The Times Guide to English Style and Usage sensibly advises its readers not to pin their mental well-being on such matters, putting it beautifully. Beware of organisations that have apostrophe variations as their house style, e.g. St Thomas Hospital, where we must respect their whim. Assuming we're all a little sick and tired of the apostrophe by now, let's consider the comma. When the humorist James Thurber was writing for New Yorker editor Harold Ross in the 1930s and 40s, the two men often had very strong words about commas. According to Thurber's account of the matter, Ross seemed to believe there was no limit to the amount of clarification you could achieve if you just kept adding commas. Thurber, by self-appointed virtuous contrast, saw commas as so many upturned office chairs unhelpfully hurled down the wide open corridor of readability and so they endlessly disagreed. If Ross were to write red, comma, white, comma, and blue, Thurber would defiantly state a preference for red, white, and blue with none at all, on the provocative grounds that all those commas make the flag seem rained on. They give it a furled look. But Ross, it seems, was unmoved by sarcasm, and in the end Thurber simply had to resign himself to Ross's way of thinking. After all, he signed the cheques. Thurber was once asked... Why did you have a comma in the sentence, after dinner, comma, the men went into the living room? His answer was probably one of the loveliest things ever said about punctuation. This particular comma, explained Thurber, was Ross's way of giving the men time to push back their chairs and stand up. Why the problem? Why the scope for such differences of opinion? Aren't there rules for the comma just as there are rules for the apostrophe? Well, yes, but you'll be entertained to discover that there's a significant complication in the case of the comma. More than any other mark, the comma draws our attention to the mixed origins of modern punctuation and its consequent mingling of two quite distinct functions. One, to illuminate the grammar of a sentence. Two, to point up, rather in the manner of musical notation, such literary qualities as rhythm, direction, pitch, tone and flow. This is why grown men have knocked down fights over the comma in editorial offices, because these two roles collide head-on all the time. Things were so simple at the start, before grammar came along and ruined everything. The earliest known punctuation, credited to Aristophanes of Byzantium, around 200 BC, was a three-part system of dramatic notation involving single points at different heights on the line, advising actors when to breathe in preparation for a long bit, or a not-so-long bit, or a relatively short bit. And that's all there was to it. A comma, at that time, was the name of the relatively short bit. The word means in Greek a piece cut off. For a millennium and a half, punctuation's purpose was to guide actors, chanters and readers aloud through stretches of manuscript, indicating the pauses, accentuating matters of sense and sound and leaving syntax mostly to look after itself. Punctuation developed slowly and cautiously because it was such intensely powerful juju. Pause in the wrong place and the sense of a religious text can alter in significant ways. 
For example, as Cecil Hartley pointed out in 1818 in his Principles of Punctuation, consider the difference between the following. Verily, I say unto thee, comma, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise, and verily, I say unto thee, this day, comma, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Huge doctrinal differences hang on the placing of this comma. The first version, which is how Protestants interpret the passage, lightly skips over the whole unpleasant business of purgatory and takes the crucified thief straight to heaven with our Lord. The second promises paradise at some later date to be confirmed, as it were, and leaves purgatory nicely in the picture for the Catholics who believe in it. Of course, if Hebrew or any of the other ancient languages had included punctuation, 2,000 years of scriptural exegesis need never have occurred, and a lot of clever, dandruffy people could certainly have spent more time in the fresh air. But there was no punctuation in those ancient texts, and that's all there is to it. Stylists have always dickered with the rules. Gertrude Stein called the comma servile and refused to have anything to do with it. Peter Carey cleverly won the Booker Prize in 2001 for a book that contained no commas at all. And lawyers eschew the comma as far as possible, regarding it as a troublemaker. Readers grow so accustomed to the dwindling incidence of commas in public places that when signs go up saying, No dogs please, only one person in a thousand bothers to point out that actually, as a statement, no dogs please is an indefensible generalisation, since many dogs do please. As a matter of fact, they rather make a point of it. The use of commas cannot be learned by rule. Such was the opinion of the great Sir Ernest Gowers, and I have to say I find that a comfort coming from the grand old boy himself. However, rules certainly exist for the comma. First, there are commas for lists. This is probably the first thing you ever learn about commas, that they divide items in lists but aren't required before the and at the end. Thus, the four refreshing fruit flavours of opal fruits are orange, comma, lemon, comma, strawberry and lime. The colours of the Union Jack are red, comma, white and blue. The rule here is that the comma is correct if it can be replaced by the word and or or. If you feel safe paddling in these sparklingly clear shallows of comma usage, think again. See that comma-shaped shark fin ominously slicing through the waves in this direction? Well, start waving and yelling, because it's the so-called Oxford comma, also known as the serial comma. Here, in case you don't know what it is yet, is the perennial example of the Oxford comma, as espoused by Harold Ross. The flag is red, comma, white, comma, and blue. So, are you for it or against it? Do you hover in between? In Britain, where standard usage is to leave it out, there are those who put it in. In America, conversely, where standard usage is to leave it in, there are those who make a point of removing it, especially journalists. British grammarians will concede that sometimes the extra comma prevents confusion, as when there are other ands in the vicinity. I went to the chemist, comma, Marks and Spencer, comma, and Nat West. My own feeling is that one shouldn't be too rigid about the Oxford comma. Sometimes the sentence is improved by including it. Sometimes it isn't. There are some more points about commas in lists before we move on. In a list of adjectives, again the rule is that you use a comma where an and would be appropriate. That is, where the adjectives are all modifying the same thing to the same degree. For example, it was a dark, comma, stormy night. In other words, the night was dark and stormy but you don't use a comma for, it was an endangered white rhino. This is because here the adjectives are doing their jobs in joyful combination. They aren't intended as a list. Then commas are used when two complete sentences are joined together with such conjunctions as and, or, but, while, and yet. For example, the boys wanted to stay up until midnight, comma, but they grew tired and fell asleep. Trouble arises with this joining comma rule from two directions. First, when stylists deliberately omit the conjunction and just keep the comma, this is the so-called splice comma that John Updike is accused of, and secondly, when the wrong joining words are used. The splice comma first. It was the Queen's birthday on Saturday, comma, she got a lot of presents. Now, so many highly respected writers adopt the splice comma that a rather unfair rule emerges. Only do it if you're as famous as Samuel Beckett, E.M. Forster or Somerset Maugham. Done knowingly by an established writer, the comma splice is effective, poetic, dashing. Done ignorantly by ignorant people, 
it's awful. Meanwhile, words that mustn't be used to join two sentences together with a comma are however and nevertheless, as in, it was the Queen's birthday on Saturday, comma, nevertheless, comma, she had no post whatever. What's needed is either a new sentence or a semicolon. It was the Queen's birthday on Saturday, semicolon, nevertheless, comma, she had no post whatever. Commas can be used before direct speech, though many writers prefer to use colons. Others just open the speech marks, a pretty unambiguous sign that direct speech is coming. Personally, I seem to ring the changes, though it would be a shame to see this use of the comma go. The Queen said, comma, open speech marks, doesn't anyone know it's my birthday? Close speech marks. Then there are the commas that come in pairs. The first rule of bracketing commas is that you use them to mark both ends of what's inserted. The commas indicate the places where the reader can, as it were, place an elegant two-pronged fork and cleanly lift out a section of the sentence, leaving no obvious damage to the whole. Thus, the Queen, comma, who has double the number of birthdays of most people, comma, celebrated yet another birthday. The bit between the commas can be removed, leaving the sentence arguably less interesting, but grammatically entire. Incidentally, there is actual mental cruelty involved in opening up a pair of commas and then neglecting to deliver the closing one. The reader hears the first shoe drop and then strains in agony to hear the second. Take the example, the Highland Terrier is the cutest, comma, and perhaps the best of all dog species. Sensitive people trained to listen for the second comma after best find themselves quite stranded by that kind of thing. They feel cheated. However, why is it that sometimes these pairs of commas are incorrect? Consider the difference between the people in the queue who managed to get tickets were very satisfied, no commas, and the people in the queue, comma, who managed to get tickets, comma, were very satisfied. In the first case, the reader infers from the absence of commas that not everyone in the queue was fortunate. Some people didn't get tickets. The people in the queue who managed to get tickets were very satisfied. In the second version, everyone in the queue gets tickets. Hurrah! The people in the queue, comma, who managed to get tickets, comma, were very satisfied. The issue here is whether the bit between the commas is defining or not. If the clause is defining, you don't need to present it with a pair of commas. Let's move on. When I was about 14, a school friend who spent the summer holidays in Michigan set me up with an American pen pal. The trouble was, Kerry Ann was an everyday teenager with no literary pretensions. And for some reason, this made the precocious blue stocking in me feverishly uncomfortable. When her first letter arrived, I was absolutely appalled. In huge handwriting like an infant's, it was on pink paper with carefree spelling errors and where the dots over the eyes ought to be, there were bubbles. She told me she was strawberry blonde with a dusting of freckles. To this day, I'm ashamed of what I did to Kerry Ann, who unsurprisingly never wrote back. I replied to her childish letter on grown-up deckled green paper with a fountain pen. I deliberately dropped the word desultory. I may even have used some French. The main reason I recall this shameful teenage episode, however, is that in my mission to blast little Kerry Ann out of the water, I pulled out literally all the stops. I used a semicolon. I watch television in a desultory kind of way, semicolon. I find there's not much on. And it felt so good, you know. It felt fantastic. Using the apostrophe correctly merely tells the world you aren't a thicko. Using the comma well announces that you have an ear for sense and rhythm, confidence in your style and a proper respect for your reader, but it doesn't mark you out as a master of your craft. But colons and semicolons, well, they're in a different league, my dear. They give such lift. Of course, nothing is straightforward in the world of literary taste. Just as there are writers who worship the semicolon, there are other high stylists who dismiss it, who label it, if you please, middle class. That energetic enemy to all punctuation, Gertrude Stein, said that semicolons suppose themselves superior to the comma, but are mistaken. They are more powerful, more imposing, more pretentious than a comma, but they are a comma all the same, she wrote, using not a comma in the whole sentence. They really have within them, deeply within them, fundamentally within them, the comma nature. Nothing but a full stop in that one either. But how much notice should we take of those pompous sillies who denounce the semicolon? I say, none at all.
Are the colon and semicolon old-fashioned? No, but they are old. While both had been adopted into English well before 1700, confusion has surrounded their use ever since, and it's really only in the past few decades that grammarians have worked out a clear and satisfactory system for their application, tragically at precisely the time when modern technological communication threatens to wipe out the subtleties of punctuation altogether. For many years, grammarians were a bit cagey about the differences between the colon and the semicolon. By and large, however, it was decided to classify the marks in terms of weight. Thus, the comma is the lightest mark, then the semicolon, then the colon, then the full stop. Cecil Hartley, in his Principles of Punctuation, includes this little poem. At every comma, stop while one you count. At semicolon, two is the amount. A colon doth require the time of three, the period four, as learned men agree. This system of sorting punctuation marks as if they were musical rests of ascending value has gone unquestioned for a long time, but I think it's rubbish, complete nonsense. Here's the American essayist Lewis Thompson on the semicolon. The semicolon tells you that something needs to be added. You get a pleasant feeling of expectancy. There is more to come. Read on. It will get clearer. But let's begin with the colon. How should you use it? A colon is nearly always preceded by a complete sentence, and in its simplest usage, it rather theatrically announces what is to come. Like a well-trained magician's assistant, it pauses slightly to give you time to get a bit worried, and then efficiently whisks away the cloth and reveals the trick complete. In the following example, can't you hear a delighted, satisfied yes when the colon comes? This much is clear, Watson, colon, it was the baying of an enormous hound. This much is clear, Watson. Yes, it was the baying of an enormous hound. But as well as the yes type colon, there is the ah type, when the colon reminds us there is probably more to the initial statement than has met the eye. I loved opal fruits as a child, colon. No one else did. I loved opal fruits. Ah, but nobody else did. A classic use of the colon is as a kind of fulcrum between two antithetical statements. Man proposes, colon, God disposes. And as George Bernard Shaw put it so well, the colon can simply pull up the reader for a nice surprise. I find fault with only three things in this story of yours, Jenkins. Colon, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So colons introduce the part of a sentence that exemplifies, restates, elaborates, undermines, explains, or balances the preceding part. They also have several formal introductory roles. They start lists, especially lists using semicolons. In later life, Carrie Ann found that there were three qualities she disliked in other people, colon, Britishness, semicolon, superior airs, semicolon, and a feigned lack of interest in her dusting of freckles. So, when do you use a semicolon? Between two related sentences, where there is no conjunction such as and or but, and where a comma would be ungrammatical. It was the baying of an enormous hound, semicolon. It came from over there. What the semicolon's anxious supporters fret about is the tendency of contemporary writers to use a dash instead of a semicolon and thus precipitate the end of the world. Are they being alarmist? A dash can often be substituted for the semicolon without much damage to the sentence. The dash is less formal, which makes it more attractive. It enhances conversational tone and it's capable of quite subtle effects. The main reason people use it, however, is that they know you can't use it wrongly, which for a punctuation mark is an uncommon virtue. But it's worth learning the different effects created by the semicolon and the dash. Whereas the semicolon suggests a connection between the two halves of a sentence, the dash ought to be preserved for occasions when the connection is a lot less direct, when it can act as a bridge between bits of fractured sense. However, so long as there remain sentences on this earth that begin with capital letters and end with full stops, there will be a place for the semicolon. True, its use is never obligatory, because a full stop ought always to be an alternative, but that only makes it the more wonderful. The semicolon has been rightly called a compliment from the writer to the reader, and a mighty compliment it is too. The subtext of a semicolon is, now, this is a hint, the elements of this sentence, although grammatically distinct, are actually elements of a single notion. The semicolon is indispensable in another capacity, when it performs the duties of a kind of special policeman, calling a bunch of brawling commas to attention. Take this comma-ridden piece. 
Fares were offered to Corfu, comma, the Greek island, comma, Morocco, comma, Elba, comma, in the Mediterranean, comma, and Paris. Margaret thought about it. She had been to Elba once and had found it dull, comma, to Morocco, comma, and found it too colourful. In such circumstances, there's no option for an upstanding semicolon other than to step in, blow a whistle, and restore order. Fares were offered to Corfu, comma, the Greek island, semicolon, Morocco, semicolon, Elba, comma, in the Mediterranean, semicolon, and Paris. Margaret thought about it. She had been to Elba once and had found it dull, semicolon, to Morocco, comma, and found it too colourful. That's much clearer. And we have you to thank, Special Policeman Semicolon. Now to its last proper use. As I hope I've made clear, it's wrong to write, he woke up in his own bed, comma, however, comma, he felt fine. Linking words such as however, nevertheless, also, consequently and hence require a semicolon. Much as I decry the old count to two system, there's an obvious take a breath thing going on here. When you read the sentence, he woke up in his own bed and he felt fine, you don't draw breath after bed, even if there's a comma there, you rattle on. Whereas when you read, he woke up in his own bed, nevertheless he was okay, an inhalation after bed is surely automatic and bed should, indeed, be followed by a semicolon. See how the sense changes with the punctuation. Let's start with two sentences. Tom locked himself in the shed. England lost to Argentina. These two statements, as they stand, could be quite unrelated. They merely tell you that two things have happened in the past. Now let's run the two sentences together, separated by a semicolon. Tom locked himself in the shed, semicolon, England lost to Argentina. We can infer from the semicolon that these events occurred at the same time, although it's possible that Tom locked himself in the shed because he couldn't bear to watch the match and therefore still doesn't know the outcome. With the semicolon in place, Tom locking himself in the shed and England losing to Argentina sound like two things that really got on the nerves of someone else. It was a terrible day, Mum, colon. Tom locked himself in the shed, semicolon, England lost to Argentina, semicolon, the rabbit electrocuted itself by biting into the power cable of the washing machine. Now run the two sentences together and separate them with a colon. Tom locked himself in the shed, colon, England lost to Argentina. All is now clear. Tom locked himself in the shed because England lost to Argentina. And who can blame him? That's what I say. It's sad to think people are no longer learning how to use the colon and semicolon. As Joseph Robertson wrote in an essay on punctuation in 1785, the art of punctuation is of infinite consequence in writing, as it contributes to the perspicuity and consequently to the beauty of every composition. Perspicuity and beauty of composition are not to be sneezed at in this rotten world. If colons and semicolons give themselves airs and graces, at least they also confer airs and graces that the language would be lost without. Everyone knows the exclamation mark, or exclamation point, as it's called in America. It comes at the end of a sentence, is unignorable and heavy-handed, and is known in the newspaper world as a screamer, a gasper, a startler, or, sorry, a dog's cock. In humorous writing, the exclamation mark is the equivalent of canned laughter. F. Scott Fitzgerald, that well-known knockabout gag man, said it was like laughing at your own jokes. Ever since it came along... Grammarians have warned us to be wary of the exclamation mark, mainly because, even when we try to muffle it with brackets, it still flashes like neon and jumps up and down. In the family of punctuation, where the full stop is daddy, and the comma is mummy, and the semicolon quietly practices the piano with crossed hands, the exclamation mark is the big attention deficit brother who gets overexcited and laughs too loud. Traditionally, it's used after... Involuntary ejaculations such as, Lord, love a duck. Salutations, oh, mistress mine. Exclamations, how many goodly creatures are there here? Emphatic pronouncements, I could really do with some opal fruits. I suppose the rule is, use an exclamation mark only when you're absolutely sure you require such a big effect. Fowler said, An excessive use of exclamation marks is a certain indication of an unpractised writer or of one who wants to add a spurious dash of sensation to something unsensational. The question mark, with its elegant seahorse profile, takes up at least double the space on the page of an exclamation mark, yet gets on people's nerves considerably less. What would we do without it? 
like the exclamation mark, is a development of the full stop, a terminator, used only at the end of sentences. Question marks are used when the question is direct. What is the capital of Belgium? When the question is inside quotation marks, it's also required. Open quotes. Did you try the mool and chips? Question mark. Close quotes. He asked. But when the question is indirect, the sentence manages without it. What was the point of all this sudden interest in Brussels, he wondered. No question mark anywhere. I asked if she had something in particular against the Belgian national character. No question mark. Increasingly, people are ignorantly adding question marks to sentences containing indirect questions, which is a bit depressing. The reason isn't hard to find. Blame the famous upward inflection caught by all teenage viewers of Neighbours in the past 20 years. Previously, people said, you know, and know what I'm saying, at the end of every sentence. Now they don't bother with the words and just use the question marks to save time. Everything ends up becoming a question. I'm talking about statements. It's getting quite annoying. But at least it keeps the question mark alive so it can't be all bad. Unsurprisingly, Gertrude Stein wasn't a fan of the question mark. It is evident, she wrote in a paragraph with minimal punctuation, a couple of commas and the final full stop, that if you ask a question, you ask a question, but anybody who can read at all knows when a question is a question. I never could bring myself to use a question mark. I always find it positively revolting, and now very few do use it. She wrote that in 1935, but those of us brought up with the question mark ethic are actually horrified when a direct question is written without a question mark, as in, for example, the film title, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Unmarked questions left dangling in this way make me feel like an old-fashioned headmaster waiting for a child to remember his manners. And, I keep wanting to say, and... Inverted commas, or speech marks, or quotes, have taken a long time to evolve. Until the beginning of the 18th century, quotation marks were used in England only to call attention to sententious remarks. Then, in 1714, someone had the idea of using them to denote direct speech and by the time of the first edition of Henry Fielding's Tom Jones in 1749, inverted commas were used by printers both to contain the speech and to indicate all the way down the left-hand margin when speech was going on. Since the 18th century, we've standardised the use of quotation marks, but only up to a point. Readers are obliged to get used to the idea from an early age that double or single is a question not applicable only to beds, tennis and cream. We see both double and single quotation marks every day, assimilate both, and try not to think about it. Having been trained to use double quotation marks for speech, however, with singles for quotations within quotations, I grieve to see the rule applied the other way round. With the poor apostrophe already confusing people so much, a sentence that begins with a single quote and contains an apostrophe after three or four words is quite confusing typographically, because you automatically assume the apostrophe is the closing quotation mark. Open single quote. I was at St Thomas, apostrophe, hospital, close single quote, she said. There is, too, a gulf between American usage and our own. Americans always use double quotation marks, and American grammarians insist that if a sentence ends with a phrase in inverted commas, all the terminal punctuation for the sentence must come tidily inside the speech marks, even when this doesn't seem to make sense. Take the sentence. Sophia asked Lord Fellamar if he was out of his senses, where the phrase out of his senses is contained within inverted commas. The British way is to put the full stop after the second set of inverted commas. The Americans put it after senses and then close the quotes. Since where and when to put other punctuation in direct speech is a real bother to some people, here are some basic rules. When a piece of dialogue is attributed at its end, conclude it with a comma inside the inverted commas. Open quotes. You are out of your senses, Lord Fellamar. Comma. Close quotes. Gasped Sophia. When the dialogue is attributed at the start, conclude with a full stop inside the inverted commas. Lord Fellamar replied. Comma. Open quotes. Love has so totally deprived me of reason that I am scarce accountable for my actions. Full stop. Close quotes. When only a fragment of speech is being quoted, put punctuation outside the inverted commas. Sophia recognised in Lord Fellamar the, open quotes, effects of frenzy. Close quotes. Full stop. When the quotation is a question or exclamation, the terminal marks come inside the inverted commas. Open quotes. Unhand me, sir! Exclamation mark, close quotes, she demanded.
But when the question is posed by the sentence rather than by the speaker, logic demands that the question mark goes outside the inverted commas. Why didn't Sophia see at once that his lordship doted on her, open quotes, to the highest degree of distraction, close quotes, question mark? The basic rule is straightforward and logical. When the punctuation relates to the quoted words, it goes inside the inverted commas. When it relates to the sentence, it goes outside. Unless, of course, you're in America. The dash is nowadays seen as the enemy of grammar, partly because overtly disorganised thought is the mode of most email and texting communication, and in these contexts, the dash does an annoyingly good job of standing in for all other punctuation marks. Perhaps the dash is a la mode because it's so easy to use, hard to use wrongly, and easy to see. Full stops and commas are often quite tiny in modern typefaces, whereas the handsome horizontal dash is a lot harder to miss. Meanwhile, the distinction between the big bold dash and its little brother the hyphen is evidently blurring these days. A dash is generally concerned to connect or separate phrases and sentences. The tiny tricksy hyphen is used quite distinctly to connect or separate individual words. Double dashes are another matter. These are a bracketing device, and the only issue is when to use brackets when dashes. Brackets come in various shapes, types and names, such as round brackets, which we call brackets and the Americans call parentheses, and square brackets, which we call square brackets and the Americans call brackets. There are several other variations. For the reader, once a bracket has been opened, a certain amount of anxiety is created that isn't dissipated until it's bloody well closed again. As Oliver Wendell Holmes remarked so beautifully, one has to dismount from an idea and get into the saddle again at every parenthesis. Writers who place whole substantive passages in brackets can't possibly appreciate the existential suffering they inflict. When a bracket opens halfway down a left-hand page and the closing bracket is giddyingly nowhere in sight, it's like being in a play by Jean-Paul Sartre. Let's move on to the ellipsis, or three dots. I recently heard of someone studying the ellipsis for a PhD, and I have to say, I was horrified. The ellipsis is the black hole of the punctuation universe, surely, into which no right-minded person would willingly be sucked for three years, with no guarantee of a job at the end. But at least when this thesis is complete, it may tell us whether rumours are true, and that dead dot dot dot, and never called me mother, in the stage version of East Lynn, was really the first time it was used. The proper uses of the ellipsis are quite specific and very few. First, to indicate words missing from a quoted passage. Then, to trail off in an intriguing manner, which is always a good way to end anything, of course, in an intriguing manner. Consider the power of erotic suggestion contained in the traditional three-dot chapter ending. He swept her into his arms. She was powerless to resist. All she knew was she loved him. Dot, dot, dot. I've mentioned the hyphen briefly already. Let's consider it in a bit more detail. One of the most profound things ever said about punctuation came in an old-style guide of the Oxford University Press in New York. If you take hyphens seriously, it said, you will surely go mad. And it's true. It's a funny old mark, the hyphen. Always has been. People have argued for its abolition for years. Woodrow Wilson said the hyphen was the most un-American thing in the world, but he needed a hyphen for un-American. Yet there'll always be a problem about getting rid of the hyphen. If it's not extramarital sex with a hyphen, it is perhaps extramarital sex, which is quite a different bunch of coconuts. Phrases abound that cry out for hyphens. The little used car, the superfluous hair remover, the pickled herring merchant and the 200 odd members of the Conservative Party would all be lost without it. Traditionally, it joins together words, or joins words with prefixes, to aid understanding, and it keeps certain other words neatly apart, with an identical intention. Thus, the pickled hyphen herring merchant can hold his head high. The fate of the hyphen is, of course, implicated in a general change occurring in the language at the moment. I've heard that people with double-barrelled names are simply unable to get the concept across these days, because so few people at the other end of a telephone know what a hyphen is. As a consequence, they receive credit cards printed with the name Anthony Armstrong, Jones, Anthony Armstrong, apostrophe, Jones, or even Anthony Armstrong, and then spelled out, hyphen. 
Where should hyphens still go before we sink into a depressing world without them? Well, there are many legitimate uses for the hyphen. For example, to prevent people casting aspersions at herring merchants who've never touched a drop in their lives. And again, many words require hyphens to avoid ambiguity. Words such as co-respondent or reformed. A reformed rock band is quite different from a reformed one. Likewise, a long-standing friend is different from a long-standing one. It's still necessary to use hyphens when spelling out numbers, such as 32, 49, and when linking nouns with nouns, such as the London Brighton train, or adjectives with adjectives, like American-French relations. Though it's less rigorously applied than it used to be, there is a rule that when a noun phrase is used to qualify another noun, it's hyphenated. The train that leaves at 7 o'clock is the 7 hyphen o'clock train. And purely for expediency, the hyphen is used to avoid an unpleasant linguistic condition called letter collision in words such as de-ice or shell-like. Even bearing all these rules in mind, however, and there are even more, one can't help feeling that the hyphen's for the chop. Fowler's modern English usage, as far back as 1930, was advising that wherever reasonable, the hyphen should be dropped. And when you consider that 50 years ago it was correct to hyphenate Oxford Street as Oxford hyphen Street, spelt with a small s, or tomorrow as to hyphen morrow, you can't help feeling that prayer for eventual light in our darkness may be the only sane course of action. Our system of punctuation was produced in the age of printing, by printers, and is reliant on the ascendancy of printing to survive. Our punctuation exists as a printed set of conventions. It's evolved slowly because of printing's innate conservatism and is effective only if readers have been trained to appreciate the nuances of the printed page. The good news for punctuation is that the age of printing has been glorious and has held sway for more than half a millennium. The bad news for punctuation, however, is that the age of printing is due to hold its official retirement party next Friday afternoon at half past five. I blame all the emails and text messages people say when you talk about the decline in punctuation standards. Well, yes. The effect on language of the electronic age is obvious to all, even though the process has only just begun, and its ultimate impact is as yet unimaginable. I write quite differently in emails, people say, with a look of inspired and happy puzzlement. I feel it's okay to use dashes all the time, and exclamation marks, and those dot 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 things. Everyone's doing the same. This is an exciting time for the written word. It's adapting to the ascendant medium, which happens to be the most immediate, universal and democratic written medium that has ever existed. It's all happening too quickly for some people, but there's no immediate cause for panic. If the book is dying, then at least it's treating its loyal fans and the bookshops to an extravagant and extended swan song. But when we look around us at the state of literacy, it just has to be borne in mind that books are no longer the main vehicles for language in modern society – that if our fate is in the hands of the barbarians, there's an observable cultural shift that can only make matters worse. As I've already mentioned, by tragic historical coincidence, a period of abysmal undereducating in literacy has coincided with this unexpected explosion of global self-publishing. Thus, people who don't know their apostrophe from their elbow are positively invited to disseminate their writings to anyone on the planet stupid enough to double-click and scroll. And it hurts. It hurts like hell. Even in the knowledge that our punctuation has arrived at its present state by a series of accidents. Even in the knowledge that there are at least 17 rules for the comma, some of which are beyond explanation by top grammarians. It's a matter for despair to see punctuation chucked out as worthless by people who don't know the difference between whose, who apostrophe s, and whose, w-h-o-s-e, and whose bloody automatic grammar checker can't tell the difference either. Despair was the initial impetus for producing this work. I saw a sign for books with an apostrophe in it, and something deep inside me snapped. I know that language moves on. It has to. There have been a number of changes to punctuation practice in our own lifetimes that haven't troubled us much. The way we write out an address in a letter or on an envelope, for example. Not so very long ago, it would be replete with commas and full stops. Today, we avoid them wherever possible. And nobody says, you can find it at BBC full stop co full stop UK, do they? Even the most high bound of us don't mind this word dot getting into the language. Above all, though, a revolution in typographical spacing occurred so quietly that very few people noticed. Spaces were closed up, other spaces were opened, nobody campaigned. 
Dashes which were once of differing lengths for different occasions are now generally shorter, of uniform length, and sit between spaces. Until very recently, typists were taught to leave a two- or even three-space gap after a full stop, but now word processing programmes will automatically reduce the gap to a single word space. Semicolons and colons used to have a word space preceding them and two spaces after, and to be honest, it looked very elegant, but nobody does that anymore. My point is that while massive change from the printed word to the bloody electronic signal is inevitably upon us, we die-hard punctuation lovers are perhaps not as rigid as we think we are. Where does this leave people who love the comma and the apostrophe? Where can we turn for consolation? Well, it's useful to remember how depressing the forecasts for language used to be before the internet came along. Thirty years ago, we assumed that television was the ultimate enemy of literacy and that under the onslaught from image and sound, the written word would rapidly die out. Such fears at least have been dissipated, with text messaging and emailing becoming such compulsive universal activities, reading and writing are now more a fact of everyday life than they've ever been. The text message may be a vehicle for some worrying verbal shorthand, yet every time a mobile goes beep beep, beep beep, annoyingly within earshot on the bus, we should be grateful for a technological miracle that stepped in unexpectedly to save us from a predicted future that couldn't read at all. Punctuation as we know it, however, is surely in for a rocky time. Is it an option to cling on to the punctuation and grammar we know and love? Hope occasionally flares up and dies down again. In May 1999, Bob Hirschfield wrote a news story in the Washington Post about a computer virus far more insidious than the recent Chernobyl menace that was spreading throughout the internet. What did this virus do? It refused to deliver emails containing grammatical mistakes. Could it be true? Was the world to be saved at a single stroke? Or even, if we must, at forward slash? Sadly, no. The story was a wind-up. Hirschfield's intention was simply to satirise the public's appetite for wildly improbable virus scare stories. In the process, however, he painted such a heavenly vision of future grammatical happiness that he inadvertently broke the hearts of sticklers everywhere. Given all that we know about the huge changes operating on our language at the moment, and given all that we know about the shortcomings of the punctuation system produced by the age of printing, should we be bothering to fight for the 17 uses of the comma? Isn't it the case, in the end, that punctuation is just a set of conventions and that conventions have no intrinsic worth? But after journeying through the world of punctuation and seeing what it can do, I'm all the more convinced we should fight like tigers to preserve our punctuation, and we should start now. There's more at stake than the way people read and write. If we value the way we've been trained to think by centuries of absorbing the culture of the printed word, we mustn't allow the language to return to the chaotic scriptio continua swamp from which it so bravely crawled less than 2,000 years ago. We have a language that's full of ambiguities. We have a way of expressing ourselves that is often complex and elusive, poetic and modulated. All our thoughts can be rendered with absolute clarity if we bother to put the right dots and squiggles between the words in the right places. Proper punctuation is both the sign and the cause of clear thinking. If it goes, the degree of intellectual impoverishment we face is unimaginable. One of the best descriptions of punctuation comes in a book entitled The Fiction Editor, The Novel and the Novelist by Thomas McCormack. He says the purpose of punctuation is, quote, to tango the reader into the pauses, inflections, continuities and connections that the spoken line would convey. Punctuation, he writes, is a means and its end is helping the reader to hear, to follow. And here's a funny thing. If all these high moral arguments have had no effect, just remember that ignorance of punctuation can have rather large practical repercussions in the real world. In February 2003, a Cambridge politics lecturer named Glenn Rangwalla received a copy of the British government's most recent dossier on Iraq. He quickly recognised in it the wholesale copying of a 12-year-old thesis by American doctoral student Ibrahim al-Marashi, reproduced, he wrote, word for word, misplaced comma for misplaced comma. Oh yes, Rangwala noticed there were some changes to the original, such as the word terrorists, substituted for opposition groups, but otherwise much of it was identical. In publishing his findings, he wrote, even the typographical errors and anomalous uses of grammar are incorporated into the Downing Street document. For example, Marashi had written, Saddam appointed, comma, Sabir Abdalaziz al-Duri as head, Note the misplaced comma. 
the UK officials who used Marashi's text hadn't. Thus, on page 13, the British dossier incorporates the same misplaced comma. So, we ignore the rules of punctuation at our political peril as well as to our moral detriment. Who would have thought a British government would be rumbled on a comma, and a Yobbs comma at that? Doesn't it feel good to know this, though? It does. It really does. Eats, Shoots and Leaves was written and read by Lynn Truss.